Hello and welcome everybody to another stunning episode of Behind the Counter. I'm your host Rich Stambolin and with me as always is the man of tomorrow, Jonathan Adler. I'm more like the man of uh, things that have not happened yet. Not so much tomorrow. The man of an ambiguously <laughs> encroaching future. <laughs> Mr. Nebulous. <laughs> they can call me Mr. Nebulous. All right, so uh, we're starting a little late today, we have, uh, but we're going to go God, a little so late. late. What happened? Uh, we're going to go a little extra for you. Hopefully everybody's still tuning in and um, tune it out. So uh, <laughs> what's, what's going Opt on? Opt out man? of life. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> what's going on, man? Uh, you know, uh, trying not to die every day. Um, that should yeah. be the goal. Yeah, ultimately it's the goal. Um, it, it's sometimes achieved, uh, but every day feels like death. Do you get do you get weirded out when you meet dudes like strangers at a bar and um, you're like, oh hey, how you doing? And they're like, well, I'm here, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really dark. Uh, I well, I'm kind of guilty of it too because every year when people wish me happy birthday and mm-hmm. you know what are you doing, and I always say the same thing over and over again, trying not to die. <laughs> um, One step away from death. Like, what are you really celebrating? I mean, almost not dead. there. Almost there. I was in a bar yesterday, mm-hmm. and it resembled hell. It was like the closest thing to hell I've ever been to. Where'd you go? Uh, a place called Bedlam in the city, mm-hmm. and it was just like pictures of flayed men and like lots of dead bodies everywhere Did of like a- dead animals, and <laughs> it was so hot. So it was like it nah. was like a weird like you know like in uh, what's that awesome Clint Eastwood movie when they paint the town red and make it look like hell? Um, oh, um, not the Outlaw Josie Wales. No, uh, not, not Two Meals for Sisters. White, pl- uh, White Plains Drifter. High Plains Drifter. Drifter. Yeah, it was like that. Yeah. It was like, you know, a weird, like, carbon mm-hmm. cutout, like, hell. But the court was beautiful. It's called Bedlam for a reason. They had a giant moose. Like, you yeah. know, like, a moose that was, like, as big as, like, six of you. <laughs> wow. And it was just a head. It's a big moose. Uh, and I wanted to live inside of it. That's almost like that Stefan bit from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Dude, that's my favorite thing on Saturday Night Live. It's, it's pretty Stephane. funny. The Stefan thing. I can't get enough of the, um, the Bill Hader Dateline thing. When, with the, when he interviews the murderers, and he's like I don't know if I oddly this. getting happy about it, or he's like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I remember this one. Check it, there's three of them. It, they're all hysterical. It's just him interviewing weirdos, and um, he's actually like a real guy. I forgot the guy's name on Dateline, but apparently he does the same thing. Where, Wait. <laughs> like, he's excited. He's like, you know, so tell me about the tragedy, and like one la- and one of them, one lady's like, oh, we found my husband in the, uh, in the trunk of a car, and he's like, was he all right? <laughs> he's like, no, he was dead. <laughs> oh, I do it. Yeah, I do. I just do it. Everything he does is great. He's 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 brilliant on that show. Fantastic. Also, hey, he has a weird. Um, this is, I'm tangentially oh. relating it to comics because he has a weird, um, comic thing too. Because yep. he uh, he introed Neil Gaiman at um, New York Comic Con a couple of years ago, and yep. like he's in touch with like the comic scene and the comic. Well, world. he wrote. He wrote comics. He did. He wrote like oh, that uh, Spider Man Spider Man thing. Yeah, that was, was actually pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. So uh, good. him and some and isn't it uh, him and Seth uh, Seth Myers? Yeah, you're gonna say Seth Rogen. I was gonna say Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane, it's <laughs> an evil name. Um, yeah, like uh, Bill Hader's probably <laughs> the best thing on Saturday Night Live ever, right? ever, and ever. Better than Eddie Murphy. Better <laughs> than Jesus Christ. <laughs> better than them all. Um, we're gonna have him on the show probably never. Uh, uh, so, uh never say never, brother. That would be cool. We run into him on the street, say, "Hey, man, you know, we do, do our, all the voices, <laughs> do all the voices, do John Malkovich for us." You know. Oh, his Malkovich is amazing. His Malkovich is amazing. Uh, his uh, uh, Willem Dafoe is really awesome. Fantastic. When he did that thing with James Franco, where he was playing like the reflection mm-hmm. of James Franco in the in the you know the mirror from <laughs> Spider Man, <laughs> is really really good. Fantastic. Um, so comic news this week. <laughs> It gives you the uh, the mammoth the mammoth growl. I kind of kind of slow news week again. Yeah, it um, was. Well, like uh, last week. What we happened? Had, uh, I don't even remember what happened this week. Jerry Robinson died uh, last week, which you know, rest Jerry in peace, Robinson. Jerry Robinson, who uh, created the Joker. Oh yes, um, Joe Simon died. He was super old, and Joe Simon also at ninety eight died, who was uh, one of the creators of Captain America. Who'd have thought? So you know, we uh, give you our best. And another guy died too, an artist. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I forgot his name, but we don't care. He, uh, he. Uh, listen, we we have. This is not all we do. We have full time jobs, full time student jobs. Hey, I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe Simon is uh-huh. uh, is the one I'm gonna miss the most. He's my favorite. Yeah, but I, I mean, like it's it, you never you never get that with with like celebrity unless they're like literary celebrities where um, they'll live to be like a ripe old age. 
Yeah. You know, and which is like fantastic because like these people are still sought after. Um, you know, somebody like uh who's a guy who doesn't who never does interviews? A New York cat. He's an older dude. Um not in, in comics? Yeah, in comics. That never does interviews. But he's like around is it Sanat? Joe Sanat? Or no. Who? Joe Sanat. Joe Sanat. Yeah. Who's Joe Sanat? Or uh Bishema. It's one of the old classic Spidey dudes who never does Oh, um, uh what's his name? Uh, he designed like all the mm-hmm. Spider Man stuff. Um Is it Ditko? The one who lo- yeah, Steve yeah. Ditko who lost his mind. Ditko, yeah. 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 The last interview he did was seventy three. Right. I know that. Mm-hmm. Uh he did another one after that. Correction. <laughs> False. Uh because he did a thing with in Britain over with uh uh-huh. Jonathan Ross, which is okay. holds my name. Uh That's so weird. <laughs> But he barely like spoke, and it was like him like opening the door of his like apartment in New mm. York, and just like I hate Jews. It's <laughs> <laughs> not true. It's not true. <laughs> Slam. <laughs> yeah. Not true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you know, like these guys, which is which is awesome because then like a lot of these dudes still contribute. Like um, a couple of years ago, we had um, one of my favorite artists, uh, Gene Colan, died. And that dude he's was still dead. Uh, yeah, he's back by now. That dude was uh was was cranking it out like pretty much until the moment he, he was. Died, yeah. You know? Uh, always like fantastic stuff. A uh, lot of interesting. I'm trying to look at remember like what happened this week in terms of news. Uh-huh. Uh, not a whole lot, I don't think. Yeah, there wasn't really any major kind of things. No real like shifts in anything. It was a good book week though. It was a fantastic book week. A lot of cool stuff came out, and a lot of like not so interesting stuff. I don't know if you noticed this week, but I feel like a lot of um, a lot of the Marvel books like, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cite two examples. One with um. Uh, the sh- with Shield, which it looked like the lettering was a little different, and it kept I didn't read that it yet. kept throwing me off. Yeah, you know, and there was like another. Well, they're like, poor now. Yeah, everyone's poor. Every Marvel is poor. Mm-hmm. They're just uh, they're using old typewriters and just photocopying everything now. It's old school, like Mad Men, um, and uh, Avengers Academy too, because it, like I love Tom Rainey, Tom Rainey's art. I think it's fantastic, but in this issue, I feel like it, it it didn't live up to like his previous stuff, you know. And I hate it when that happens. I know it's time constraints, and I know it's like a million other projects. But you know, no when, excuses. when you're on a book that you're looking forward to, uh, and I, I always have that problem with Derek Robertson too. When he was doing Boys, yeah, and he, his style was so gritty and like so excellent and intense. And then at one point, it just got very like like flat. You know, yeah, the, the, the <laughs> appeal of his stuff. Well, you, if you look at his stuff when he did, like, uh, I think his pinnacle was the the beginning of Boys was really yeah. good. But like the Wolverine Greg Booker <laughs> stuff was just like yeah. it was so visceral and yeah. so like. You know, yeah, you're chunky Wolverine. Yeah. Uh, but everything looked like there was such an attention to detail. Absolutely. But you definitely saw that, like, kind of... And, he, and it was good that mm-hmm. he actually did remove himself from the book. Right, right. You know, and yeah. said, so, like, I really can't do the output I used to do. Yeah. And and his output was fantastic. Like, he he drew the Wolverine that looked like weighed a 1,000 pounds. Yeah, man. You know, and, like, all those those fantastic covers and, like, those fantastic interiors where Wolverine would just get shot up and, like, the attention to detail this guy would put into it, you know, with, with the bullet wounds and, like, the slash marks. And he made him super gross in the face. Yeah. You know, he, he wasn't, was like, dude. a huge Ackman. Um, he was such Wolverine. an ugly, ugly dude. Yeah, Lennon Liu also does a great uh, Wolverine. He's someone who I feel like kind of slept in style too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when when I first kind of got his attention, or he got my attention, I didn't get his attention. He doesn't know me. You want to draw a book for me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyone wants to draw a book for me? I got some great ideas. <laughs> uh, he, I think he really like kind of slept when he when he first started like in the Avengers books and. Uh-huh. Uh, Start poking his head out in like the mainstream stuff. Mm-hmm. I think now he's a little bit more sketchy, okay, um, and just seems a little bit more rushed. But mm-hmm. it happens. Well, there, there was a, there was a thing that I caught on Can't a th- winners through uh, through Twitter where some guy was trying to pass off um, Lenel Yu's art as part of his portfolio. What a scumbag! You know, and he and like Lenel Yu linked it on Twitter saying like, "Check this guy out. Hey, that's my drawing Wolverine." And you go to the guy's website and it's like, "I handle commercial art," and it's like it's. Uh, it's a picture of Wolverine with smoking bullet holes. Handle these nuts. And he's like, I'm going to take care of this. And like the guy just took it down immediately. Ugh. You know? That happens all the time. There's always like people impersonating mm. or, or saying they have like a, you know, a Batman Jim Lee head sketch and they're passing it off as like, you know, uh, yeah. legitimate and it's just like a trace drawing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's weird because like I feel like there's no thought that goes into like that kind of plagiarism because you're like, listen, people, this is a genre that people love. That are extremely passionate get, about, you know. Yeah, but you try to get away with it as long as yeah. you, you know humanly can, which mm-hmm. is just like miserable and you know a bit of like artistic rape. Yeah, yeah. See, I find I find that also happens with a lot of um, the journalism out there too, as far as comic book goes, because um, uh, we're gonna do. Uh, I might as well kick it off. We're gonna do a segment today about um, shocking moments in comics. You know, like just uh, stuff that gives you like a great guttural reaction. 
that you didn't see coming that wasn't spoiled for you that just kind of like really flipped your lid where you're sitting there and you're kind of shaking the comic book. But um, I was doing my research today and lid flippers, huh? Lid flippers. Lid flippers. <laughs> I was doing my research today, and I found that like a lot of these lists just get reblogged with a couple yeah. of different words. Did the same put thing, yeah. You know, yep. And I'm like, all right, like these, but it's all the same stuff that's being written. It's all about the same material, in a different order, with different like like a word changed here and there. You, you know? saw, yeah, you saw. I saw the same list over and over yeah. again. Like the same, like you'd see like the the uh, the death of Jason Todd, like in this, like just mm-hmm. moved around in the same list. Cat punching Hitler. Yeah, yeah, you know. But um, like like I said, like which is which is shocking, but you know, not. To, I'm I'm saying like. <laughs> Okay. I think the way the way you uh, you approached it was uh, correct me if I'm wrong is that you wanted to do like an like a book in hand, not something where we heard about where like right like a killing joke. So was, yeah, so we had so the whole thing is that you know I was thinking about today because uh, right now I'm reading the Game of Thrones books mm-hmm. and they are like close to where Walking Dead is, where there anyone can die, anything can happen, and so it evokes a really strong emotional impact. So. Mm-hmm. In making this kind of segment up, I'm kind of steering away from things like, say, like Nightfall. Like right. Nightfall, you saw right. a mile coming away. You know, like you, it was being booked as this is going to mm-hmm. be the breaking of of uh, a Batman, right. Death of Superman. You knew it was coming ahead of time. Um, I'm talking about pure, like you turn the page, something tremendous happens, mm-hmm. and it's just like you're like, holy shit! Like what? Yeah. Is, you know what's going on? Because um, those are like really strong moments. Yeah. Those are like, I think. If the book was halfway decent, mm. it puts it over the top. It does, and it's uh, those are also the little moments that keep you coming back and like yeah. begging for more. Um, the 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 thing about comic books is that you know we need uh, sometimes you need as many as you can because even though they're serialized, you're still waiting a month. You know, you're waiting four weeks, whereas like if you're watching TV, you wait a week. You know, um, so it, it it generates that water cooler talk. Of like, I wonder what's going to happen, and all the speculation that kind of comes with it, which is part of being a fan. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, you know, it's, it's something extremely enjoyable. When you uh, broached the issue to me, the first thing I thought of, for some reason, was one of my one of my favorite shocking moments, is w- in Astonishing X Men number four. Yeah, man. Where uh, it Colossus returns. Oh, um, by the way, uh, this whole segment will be spoilers. So yeah, <laughs> so get with it. <laughs> so so now you're on the other end. Yeah, and we're on this end. Um, but yeah, when Colossus came back, Astonishing X Men number four. Fantastic yeah, freaking man. reveal, man! And that was didn't the, see it coming. Uh, Josh Whedon and John Cassidy doing the book. Yep, you know, and it was like, and it was handled so well, just mm-hmm. because it was like he comes back and like Kitty's reaction, you know, because that was her old lover, right? And she's a like, kind of stunned, and he just like runs past her because yep. she's you know to go fight the bad guys, and he phases, you know, she phases through mm-hmm. him, and, and it's so cool, so fantastic. And then like the mo- the moment in that issue that. That that will always stick in my head is when he does the fastball special. Yeah, you know, or he's like he basically the Wolverine saying like you still got it, Pete, and he's like you bet, dude. The f- <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, that well, his run is just amazing, but like that mm-hmm. was like a really kind of uh, surprising thing. He was dead yeah. for two years before that happened, which is you know kind of the way we are with like Jean Grey at this point. She's been yeah. dead for a really really long yeah. time. Yeah. We're going almost ten years with her being dead. They're hinting big time at something. Like yeah. they're hinting at the Phoenix thing. They're, yeah, those going to be. I know? think it's. I think she will come back in some way, shape, or form. And it's and it's excellently excellently set are, up. Are they hinting at like another Phoenix saga? Like they're yeah. hinting at like a like they keep showing like Phoenix images. You know. And yeah, because like, the Phoenix was phenomenal. I mean, the original was yeah. was ex- well, really the, well done. Yeah, Marvel's next big thing is going to be a, a big crossover between Avengers and X Men. Right. And it, the crux of it is like the return of Phoenix, but yeah, the work. Phoenix Force, but not so much Jean Grey. But right. you're talking about like Scarlet Witch is gonna be part of it. Yeah. Uh Hope, which was she was rumored to be like a reborn Jean Grey Jean for Grey, a while. Right. Um it'll be good. It'll be surprising. Well, I mean, uh when when well, let's not get into that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um uh, that, that that's gonna be another shocking moment yeah. that comes like that you can almost see coming. The first one I, I thought of when, when mm-hmm. I it came up was uh the Zorn reveal in, in Grant Morrison's X Men. Very excellent. Yeah. Uh because you had this character Zorn who mm-hmm. had the mind of a, had the his brain was a star. Right. And he wore the steel mask at the mm-hmm. whole story. And at the very end of Was uh, it a star or a black hole? Black hole, I'm yeah. sorry. There's two yeah, his mm-hmm. there's a there's a star one and there's the black hole mm-hmm. in, in the ultimate universe. Um so yeah, so he, you never could see, he basically said he had no head. Mm-hmm. And then at the ver- like near the end of the storyline, they he takes off the mask and basically took out all of the, the X Men and you yep. realize it's it's Magneto. Yep. And mm-hmm. it was so awesome. It was such a reveal because mm-hmm. no one saw it coming. Exactly. The best part of it was that re- thing really helped with it was Zorn had like amazing healing ability. Yep. So 
he, what he did was during the storyline, he uh, cured Professor Xavier of, yep. of, of uh, his, you know, his paralyzed spine. Then they reveal in that that all he did was he had little nano, nano to sentinels mm-hmm. in his spine. And Magneto just manipulated them. So when he reveals he's Magneto, he basically lets him go and he drops to the ground. And it's like a heartbreaking yeah. moment. It was like really like an amazing thing. Yeah, it, it really was. And that was like uh, that that Grant Morrison run of um, of X Men is so phenomenal. And we we we've touched on it a million times. But it's something out there that you should pick up. Tons of great reveals. Tons of great characters. That Zorn thing was <clears throat> was fantastic. And uh, Morrison said in an interview not too long ago that like listen, you know, like I know people ask me if they screwed with my stuff. He's like it pretty much hit the page the way I wanted it to. Yeah, you know. Um, Afterwards, <clears throat> that's a different story. Uh, going through stuff that I thought of for the past few years, like I personally, like I st- we stumbled on um, a lot of DC stuff, which was, yeah. you know, we always talk about how when DC was good, and uh, the one thing that, that popped in my head was the um, the reveal in Fifty Two that Skeets was actually a cocoon for Mister Mind, yeah, who turned into like a Cthulhu beast who like you know, eats universes yeah. and everything. That was a that was a real like uh, mm. Fifty Two had a really strong. Because it's built on the serialization. Right. There's so many good ones, like you know, along like you brought it up today. Mm-hmm. Like, I forgot about that. Like a long aid man, uh, because of his his dead wife, mm-hmm. uh, was kind of thinking that uh, he was becoming. You, you think he's becoming an alcoholic, mm-hmm. and he's drinking this bottle the whole right. time, and then you realize it's Gingold, which makes him mm-hmm. back into elastic into yeah. a long aid man. Yeah, that was, that was such a cool. That was, it was an awesome, awesome reveal because like they established the fact that you know through through um, narration that he's giving up being a elongated man just to solve the the murder mystery of his wife and whatever else he had to do, and he was so upset by the fact that he just wanted to be a man and not a hero, and it 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 ended up that he drank all the jingold or gingold and used it in a last dish effort to kill the bad guy. Yeah, you man. know, it was such a cool mm-hmm. you know, and then all that stuff is erased now by DC, but yeah. Neither here nor there. Uh, I uh, I was really really shocked by the Captain America death, and even though he's yeah. back now, I think mm-hmm. it was such because that was really like playing with the uh, the way that things were revealed. Because mm-hmm. Civil War had wrapped up, and this was the issue of Captain America after he was arrested right. by you know the government, and to die in the steps and have it happen in Captain America's mm-hmm. own book was a huge testament to that. Yeah. Because um, usually they would just reserve all this, you know, these big reveals for something like Civil War, like yeah. in the dead center. Yeah. Um, the, the thing with the Captain America, uh, what was shot, what, what's awesome about it for, as from a fan standpoint is like you saw it coming, you didn't see the way it was going to come, mm-hmm. you didn't see how it was going to play out. Um, if you're one of those guys, I didn't see it coming at all. Yeah, you know, like if you're one of those guys who just like watches the news or reads the paper and see and is like, oh, this is going to be worth a lot of money, and you read the issue, you're not going to understand what's going on. No, you know, and it, it was like so, it wasn't even the tip of the iceberg of the story. Yeah, you know, it was just him getting murdered on the streets of uh, the Capitol building. Yeah, it was on the yeah. steps. No, it was, it was in New York. Was it New York? Yeah. Okay. I forgot what building it was in. Yeah, it was in front of a famous. But building. it was it was so great. It was like mm-hmm. the way they handed it off, and especially yeah. if you, it, was re- it was like you said, it was rewarding if you were a yeah. Captain America fan, mm-hmm. and you know you had this build up, mm-hmm. but you never saw something that's coming. It was purely like here's shock factor, and here's a brand new story going because mm-hmm. you, I mean, Winter Soldier had just come back, yep. you know, uh, which was another great reveal. Yeah. Um, but that was like I read that, and all I wanted to do was talk about it. it like yeah. it, all, you know, I wanted you know. Mm-hmm. You immediately start thinking, like, how are they going to bring him back? You know, why it happened? Mm-hmm. You don't know what's going on. And, like, you know, where are they going to take it? Are they canceling yeah. Captain America? You know, there's all this, like, powerful stuff yeah. going in your head. And, and like, that's that's the guttural reaction. And, and also when they revealed that it was Sharon Carter and not Crossbones, which was, like, awesome, ridiculous. Yeah, that, was, that was really awesome. That she was the clo- that she was the closer to him and just, like, shot him in the belly a bunch of times. Well, you know? speaking of, you know, with, with Brubaker and everything, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, him being part of the people who have been the echelon of, like, amazing Daredevil mm-hmm. writers. Like, almost all the Daredevil stuff between Bendis and Brubaker yeah. has been, like, I, I've gotten a huge reaction out of stuff Oh, like absolutely. That. Absolutely. Punisher stuff. Yeah. You know, like, you know, all this stuff. We always talk about Punisher, like Punisher mm-hmm. Max. Um, though, like, that book is built on the aspect of, like, mm-hmm. how far we can bring a character. Because uh-huh. there's no true... Uh, Repercussions because it's not in the regular Marvel universe, so right, you can go right. balls out with him. Mm. If they want to kill Punisher, Ma- you know Punisher at the end of Punisher Max, they could very well do it. They could, do it, but they can't because of the 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 last Punisher story. You could do you it, know, where uh, he's yeah, the, I know. the last man on Earth, dude. That's just amazing, <laughs> ridiculous. Walking Dead does a great job yeah. of it. They're constantly pushing the envelope on what they can do. Um, oh, forget it, man. And having those last page reveals mm. are just like so powerful. He's he's excellent. Uh, Kirkman's excellent with those last page reveals, especially Walking Dead. Where you know you have uh, Carl getting shot in the face, uh, Carl shooting Shane, <laughs> getting yeah. his hand chopped off, getting his hand chopped off. Um, 
uh, Tyrese getting his head, head cut chopped off, off by uh, everybody's getting chopped. The up. baby, the baby yep. getting blown away when mm-hmm. with his wife, dude. Like, it, well, that that's like the whole thing is like you know, it takes a lot mm-hmm. for you to be legitimately surprised these days, you yeah. know, especially with the internet and everything. Um, you know, spoilers or anything. So those closely guard secrets mm-hmm. are really, really amazing. Like, what was the one I was thinking of? Um, the Batman mind wipe. When oh, forget like, it, man. A Deadly Crisis for some reason it's yeah. been really shit upon in the last few years. Because I think it was the it was like kind of the the moment where DC became a bit darker and more adult. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people like you know they hate the idea of the rape. Yeah. Um, hit like Batman. Uh, basically found out. Yeah. During the storyline that uh, the Justice League has mind wiped, mm-hmm. um, what's his name, uh, Dr. Light. Right. And so he walks in on it, He's like, no way. This is Batman. But, like, Batman is not going to stand for this. Yep. And they basically hold him down and they get Zatanna to wipe his mind out. Mm-hmm. And what's amazing about that is, like, you're like, holy crap. Yep. What's going to happen next? How like, is Batman going to react to this? Because you yeah. knew, like, something's going on. And, like, yeah. as you, as you, if you were, like, a dedicated reader, you mm-hmm. saw a little, you know, hints and nudges because. He would like kind of give like Green Arrow a look or like right. Hawkman this look and, and and you know you saw his gears working that mm-hmm. he's fighting his own brain to remember it yeah and it's a great it was, it was a great thing the um oh, it was another one I was just thinking of oh, was it the Wonder Woman Max Lord Wonder, Wonder Woman Max Lord was really mm-hmm. amazing didn't see it coming at all yeah um there's another thing with with Batman uh not zero and I, right? uh, like I was thinking about that all mm-hmm. uh, pretty much like the R I P and the death of Bruce Wayne and mm-hmm. all that stuff uh, was all really solid, but I, I don't think any of it really gave me that that general surprise. Because again, the, you have a title yeah. called Batman R.I.P. You knew something was sure. going to happen. Yeah, the the one issue that really did surprise me that that sticks out is the uh, the, the triple story with uh, the future, but where Damien's the future Batman and he's like yeah. he's a murderer, yeah, you know, and Barbara Gordon's the commissioner, you yeah, know, which is just really meaty stuff, you know, not so much shock value. No, who's done a great job of it too? Uh, Bendis on Ultimate Spider Man. Yes. Like, he's mm-hmm. consistently made it an amazing, rewarding yeah. experience where, like, you know, if it, uh, if it's the death of a character, because, you know, Ultimate tries and, you know, I think they went a little bit overboard with Ultimatum. Okay. I kind of yeah. enjoyed it. Um, Ultimatum was the flood one. The right? flood, yeah. yeah. Okay. But it was just like so many deaths and they're mm-hmm. trying to keep them that way. Uh, but Ultimate Spider Man had these really, like, grassroots kind of, you mm-hmm. know, uh, terrible moments where you'd see, you know, uh, like, you know, Norman Osborn, you know, right. breaking into, you know, his house mm-hmm. in, in Queens. In Queens, yeah. And how, like, devastating it would be. But they, like, that would, I think Ultimate Spider-Man would, would get me the most nervous and anxiety-driven. It does, and, like, when, um, of the first issue of Fallout 2, which, was, like, the shocker yeah. was, like, I was surprised how emotional I got at that issue. Yeah. Um, you know, My with, own disappointment in myself. With the, oh. uh, the the funeral, you know? Yeah. Um, and another another excellent Spidey moment. So Spidey, Spidey's always been a very lighthearted book, but there was a period in time where, like, it just got really super dark. And one of those dark moments was... Um, when Norman Osborn was revealed to have knocked up a like an unconscious Gwen Stacy. Yeah. And uh I remember that she was She wasn't unconscious. I think she was. Nope. No. Uh the whole thing was that he uh it was when Harry was on drugs. Right. He was on LSD. Uh and she was cons- and he tried to kill himself. Mm-hmm. Norman was trying to comfort her. Right. And she was kind of like out of it, but she wasn't unconscious. Right. Okay. She remembered like the beautiful Tommy Lee Jones face, right, right, right. But that, like, that was one of the few instances where, um, you know, we worked at the at, at the comic book store together, where we actually read the issue in the store because it was so shocking. Yeah, you know? and it was so gross too because Diodato drew the Tommy Lee Jones smiling. Um, like- yeah, you know, nor- and then it, it was like it was the panel of him seducing her, kinda, and then one panel of his face, and the next panel is the Green Goblin face. Yeah, you know? it was something no lady should stare up. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Uh, what else? What else was really good? Um, Bone Claws. Bone Claws was, was yeah. really like a surprise because you know what it was? That was still a time a p- time period when Wolverine's past was really nebulous. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I th- as a kid, I always remember growing up and, and thinking about like you know what's inside Wolverine's claws, right? And I always like we would always fight: is it solid or is it hollow? Right. Yeah. Because like sometimes some artists would draw them like with the round, mm-hmm. you know, the round claws, or they're kind of like just spikes. And then you had the other people mm-hmm. who drew like the straight up blades, right? Uh, but when Magneto ripped out. Wolverine's metal, mm-hmm. which is an amazing moment right there and right. there. The next thing is, you know, him popping his claws because you think yeah. that his claws are gone now. He's got bone claws. Open mm-hmm. up a whole new like 
it was such a, like a weird, crazy yeah. reveal that you n- did not see coming at all. It was a crazy chapter. In I don't know anyone who could have like seen that coming. No, not at all. It was a, it was a crazy chapter in the in the Wolverine history, and that happened such a long time ago too, because that was like late nineties. Yeah, that was like uh, almost mid ninety six. Ninety six, and um, you had. <sighs> That like it was the cover when they started doing all that hologram crap, and you have like the cover of Magneto like whole, holding that, Wolverine out. That and, whole that whole um, what was it called? Uh, the phalanx thing? Uh, no, uh, Prime Omega. No, no, uh, no. It, was, it, it led fatal into attra- fatal attractions. Fatal attractions. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. which was an amazing. Because that's also the one with uh, with uh, that leads into that awesome Colossus where Colossus joins the acolytes. Right. There was a lot of mm. cool stuff. Yeah, John Romita drawing yeah. uncanny at that point too. Um, I, really. Like the cool thing about that is that it, it was shocking at face value and it wasn't wrapped up very fast because then you had such a like a well of stories to tell Wolverine because he was healing and then because he was so devastated that he turned into like uh like a monkey man kinda. Ugh, he was like that was the worst part of it. He was like an ape with no nose. Well he and, lost his arm too. No. Well. Yeah. No, you're talking about you thinking of uh, Age of Apocalypse when he got the yeah he got the yeah. stump, but that was the that was, that was yeah that was well that was, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that was it after yeah that was after that was, that. That was onslaught yeah. that was like a little bit after what? the onslaught stuff yeah the the, yeah. the 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 monkey Wolverine happened like right after yeah or during the, the onslaught startup or whatever yeah. yeah yeah and he had the red bandana covering his face yeah but so then dumb. um and then he got his adamantium back through Apocalypse because he made him the Angel of Death yeah which was also pretty bananas that's pretty cool um. And then you know Wolverine Origins too, which fleshed out a lot of cool Wolverine stuff. You know, yeah. like his his uh, the reveal of his real name. You know? Yeah, and most notably the uh, the the fact that he was a uh, like a girly man when he was a little boy. Yeah, yeah. and it took like a terrible like tragedy for mm-hmm. him to be what he is. Um, I love the reveal at the end of House of M with giving him uh, his memories back. Oh, fantastic! And he just like comes out of it. Like yeah. he just he just wakes up and he's like, I remember everything. Mm-hmm. Which is like I think. Kind of hinders him as a character because mm-hmm. you you kind of take away that mystique of him, a little bit. But uh, I think it's rewarding because it it it, it and I think it is what graduated him to the point he is now where he can be like a professor, right? And he can you know he's more like self assured and mm-hmm. everything. It's it's a it's a it's a really nice maturing of the character. It also it also um, helps with storytelling too because you'll have uh, you have a like a giant multitude of stories that you could tell now. Yeah. You know, where like he'll be like, listen, I gotta, you know, and those one off Wolverine stories where it's like a War II flashback, he has to go to Matterport, you know, yeah. And he's he like, con- he can confront his own, his yeah. own past. And um, I think it was J- on Jason Aaron's run. Like, that was kind of interesting. Again, not touching on him, uh, like finding anything with his memories, but kind of when oh, he goes, the, goes the, to hell. Yeah. Well, the, the kid, the, the kid stuff was my favorite stuff. Like, when they revealed, like, he's murdered everybody and also yes. his children. Excellent, excellent reveal too. The uh, you know what I liked. I, this is like I think when the the earlier ones when I was a kid is when uh, Larry Hamlin was still doing Wolverine, mm-hmm. and I remember the cover. It was you still had remember LCD and Albert. Yes, they were they were in the comic, and they were, he was fighting Sabretooth in the base in like in a sewer, uh-huh. and Sabretooth. This is the very first time I ever did this, where Sabretooth says like, "I'm your father." Right, and it was like in the middle of the book. Mm. It wasn't like the last page or anything like that. And mm. it was handled in such a weird way that it was the first time I ever was urged because before the internet, I was urged to like write a letter and like and ask them every question known to man. Right, right. I yeah. was like, it was that was purely like joy. I was like, mm. like I never thought of that. Like you know, like right. Yeah. <laughs> it was so like it was mm-hmm. so jarring. Like that, that because Wolverine was a clean slate at that point. It, he was, and that period of Wolverine too, which was like really wacky, you know, because yeah. you had like you had the whole Albert LCD thing. You had guys like oh, with like Bloodstrike coming out, like the clog. Yeah, like the, I the, love uh, Bl- uh, Bloodstrike and uh, and Roughhouse. Yeah, and yeah. like all these weird dudes trope in the Wolverine book, and it was just it's not what it is today. Where like it's, I feel like the Wolverine character now is more grounded because of all that stuff well, that he, happened. He do Matterport stuff. He'd walk yeah. around with like a members only jacket and like you know <laughs> hang out with a guy who yeah. like you know a guy named Archie who flew a mm-hmm. you know could be fifty two bomber. Yeah. Um. They had some really great stuff in in that run where they had like, uh, he got infected by the, this like Nazi scientist mm-hmm. who was like ruling over like a small like Spanish uh, island, and Roughhouse Strike and mm-hmm. Blood Strike were were his was crew, and he uh, Roughhouse gets messed up and he gets all mm-hmm. his hair burned off and he's like all pimply and he becomes like a good guy for a little while right. and there was so much crazy like he fought Tiger Shark in the bottom of the ocean and. Dude, there was like a lot, like Larry Hammer's run and like Peter David's run, yeah. are like really like slept on. See, I can't, I, I like that. That stuff is like so, like it's, a, it's like a weird distant memory to me. Where like I know what happened, but like, and I have all the issues, but I just can't. I have no recall on like a lot of well, like '90s Marvel stuff. It like was that. stuff that we we 
uh, like that type of storytelling, especially for Wolverine, is not what you wanted from Wolverine at that right. time. You wanted him like fighting Sabretooth all the time, and you wanted mm-hmm. him like doing like superhero stuff. Yeah. Now as like, an adult, you can go back and appreciate, you know, really gritty, you know, uh, kind of inspired by yeah. um, I don't know, like Indiana Jones and like Casablanca and stuff like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like that. Like uh, that's the, like a weird other thing that you can do with the Wolverine character is you can give him like that passionate. Odd, oddball love story and make him like the Bogart. Yeah. You know, um, I remember uh, this is like, it's kind of, kind of topical with, with the shocking moments is when Jim Lee did that run, the initial run on um, X Men, that was like, it was kind of moment after moment, you know. Uh, where, which one? Uh, the run on X Men. Jim Lee? Yeah. Where with, I like it. you know, like uh, introducing Omega Red and, you know, like all those kind of Maverick and like those yeah. dudes and like kind of adding to like that whole like Department X, Department H thing. Yeah. But it was so like, it was so like vague mm-hmm. and like it was Jim Lee stuff where you were just like, okay, here's another guy in a mask. I, right. As a kid, I loved it. But mm-hmm. I, I was, I, even when, even now, I'm not that impressed by okay. Omega Red. I think it was cool for what it was, but like, <laughs> I know, I know. You, we, we've talked about how we differ on uh, Omega uh-huh. Red stuff. But like I, ne- I never was really impressed by by Jim Lee. I read it. I, I, you know, I ate it up. You know, when I was a kid. Right. But um, you're talking before X Men. You're talking about the actual like uncanny stuff before X Men number one. No, no, I'm talking X Men number one and on. Um, another, it just popped into my head and it just left. Um, cool, shocking moment. I feel like because we're such huge fans of villains, when they threw Scorpion into the Venom costume. That was cool. Mm-hmm. That yeah, that was. I think that was a really original uh, yeah. take on it. Spider Man taking his mask off in Civil War. Spider Man taking his mask off Civil War was major. Yeah. Because you still didn't know where it was going to go. Yeah. That yeah. was like issue two or three. It's two. Yeah. yeah. Issue number two, um, you know, because they did the whole. Uh, the, the basis of Civil War was basically um, there, was, uh, there was an act that superheroes had to reveal themselves and work for the government, you know? Yeah. So on one end, you had Cap fighting for uh, keeping their identities, keeping their family safe. And then you had Tony Stark, who was like, listen, everybody knows who I am. I'm going to, like, everybody should know who everybody else is. And y- y- up until that point, you didn't know what side Peter Parker was going to choose. And I, I firmly thought that, like, you know what? Like, like in, yeah, like in true Spidey yeah. fashion, he'll be like, sounds like a great offer, but I know it's going to bite me in the ass. No, thanks. But he ended up taking his mask off and saying, like, hey, I'm Peter Parker. And that opened up a whole world of hurt for him. Well, that's what, yeah. yeah and, and look where we are now where he, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the one more, excuse me, one more day and, you right. know, uh, the basically remasking yeah. of Spider-Man yeah. made for even a better storyline mm-hmm. of that. It did. But again, that I feel like that is, is shock and awe done wrong. Uh, with the Mephisto thing. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, that's just a really stupid way of just putting, you know, the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Um, but the end result was was worth it. Getting yeah. past all that stuff, and, you know, it's my least favorite part of, like, what they've yeah. done Spider-Man mm-hmm. in the last, like, you know, many years since Straczynski. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the other, either. Yeah. Uh, Did you read that thing about Straczynski the other day? No. So, uh, like, I think it happened around Sunday or so. He, Straczynski just went online. Uh, Straczynski wrote a very long run. Uh, of Spider-Man mm. with Jeremy Jr. for a long time. And there's some cool yeah. stuff in there, but it's not one of my favorites. Um, but he came online and basically posted on his blog, um, oh, hey, look at the decline of the numbers mm. from when I left the book to where it is now. Uh-huh. So he basically just did like, you know, a line graph where it was just like, you know, declining. And he's like, you know, makes you think, huh? Or something like, you know, just saying. <laughs> he's, I think he ended with just saying. <laughs> so Steve Wacker, who edits, uh-huh. you know, uh, you know, Spider-Man books and is one of the better Marvel writers. Right. He did 52, you know, mm-hmm. when he came over. Um, he came on. He's like, you know what? You're pretty much shitting all over my entire creative team, everything we've done over the years. Oh, yeah. It's not like, you know, why are you doing this? And he's like, oh, you know, I just, you know, was just pulling out something that I just thought was interesting. And he's like, you said just saying. Mm-hmm. That's like the biggest middle thing you can do in an argument. Pretty much. Yeah. So like, and then Mark Wade came on and he was like screaming at him and saying like <laughs> how, uh, <laughs> You know, like, what's wrong with you? You've done this before. Uh-huh. And just like, ugh, it's just like so stupid. Mm. I hate that dude, man. I just find, I, read, I read something almost kind of similar to that with uh, with uh, Jim Shooter with the Valiant thing. Did you read that? Oh, I, was go- I, I saw the article. I didn't get a chance to read it. It was, um, me in. It was Englehart, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how Shooter says, this is like an old argument, too, how, uh, with uh, the Valiant Universe, how Shooter um, wanted to establish like a cohesive. Um, storytelling narrative for the entire Valiant universe, mm. and um, he was like, Engelhart just like he went off the cuff and he was ruining continuity. And he would show up late and he would phone in whatever he wanted to, and then he did Shadow Man, and I had to rewrite all this other crap. And they interviewed Shooter saying this about Engelhart, right? And then they interviewed Engelhart, and he was like, 
That never happened, dude. <laughs> you know, dude. This well, this uh, which I think Shooter has some of the most like he said, she said stuff yeah. in comics. He does. Um, but he was like, you know, he, uh, listen, I loved, I, I loved Valiant after mm-hmm. many, many years. Yeah. Like I didn't read it when it came out because that was not my interest at all. I did mm-hmm. not want to read about realistic superheroes. I wanted to read about guys with pouches. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's true. <laughs> but. Like going back and like you read like the first twenty five issues of Harbinger, like you get some mm. great team stuff and yeah. like you know again like where the cost is really high for it for the for characters in the book mm-hmm. and a great payoff. That's I, fantastic stuff. Yeah, there, I feel like uh, I I don't know how how good this this XO relaunch is going to be. I don't know. Mm. I want it to be good. Like I, I I mean I think the. I think it's always interesting to see uh, people try mm. and revitalize you know entire universes. Yeah, because like there hasn't been a Valiant for so long. Um, mm. The same way I appreciate uh, what they're kind of trying to do with like all that crappy Rob Byfield stuff. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to like I'm really want like I saw the uh, like a preview of Profit and how Phenomenal yeah they're they're showing like how you know it's very much like an Italian you know mm-hmm. uh, sci-fi book mm-hmm. and how you know this I think Rich Johnson was talking about how it was a originally it was all about like guns and blades and like yep. just like muscles and it's, he's kind of you know skinny and scrawny and the first thing he does he gets out of like a capsule from yep. like being hibernated and he pukes up bullets yeah and like <laughs> to start loading his gun like he's legitimately like a war prophet yeah he's uh, it's it, it looks so fantastic man and blood strikes like, gonna be awesome i feel like a lot i haven't seen anything with uh, zombies bro zombies yeah. superheroes it's going to be very good awesome. glory's going to be good um there's going to be some good stuff hey dog hey dog um what other? We had a couple more shocking moments, I think. I was saying how before uh, I'm a big fan of the Alan Moore Swamp Thing, and like there's a great part in it where Swamp Thing basically mm. takes over Gotham, and he fights Batman because Swamp Thing is terribly powerful. Swamp Thing's fighting Batman, and he uh, he beats crap out of Batman because he's a giant swamp monster, right? And then they hire Lex Luthor to be like the security council for Gotham, mm. and because basically Swamp Thing has built an ent- entire like. Uh, you know, evergreen forest inside the middle of Gotham. Right. And Lex Luthor is, you know, proclaims peace with him and he goes to hold his, you know, shake his hand or whatever and they drop a nuclear bomb on Swamp Thing and destroy his entire consciousness. And then there's like three issues of mourning and like mm-hmm. he's dead and like his wife is crying about it. Then you see the last panel of the story is him on another planet made out of like alien fauna. And I was like, holy crap. And then he gets raped by a green planet after that. Banana, <laughs> so good. <laughs> that's it. Uh, like, see, I was, I was telling you before. Like, that stuff is like again. Like, I read that stuff right when it was collected. Yeah, you know. And I got it's. It's like all this stuff that I just want to read again. Um, I feel like another another interesting reveal in the last couple of years was. Um, I'm not gonna say Lex Luthor for president because I thought that was kind of handled poorly. But putting Norman Osborn in charge of Shield. Yeah, man, that was good. You know, which was like a, a great reveal. Um, Marvel, Marvel kicks ass with like so many reveals. Like now, it's kind of hard to do something like that, especially with like the, the relaunch in DC. So you're not going to have anything at least for like another year. I feel like. Yeah. You know, where you'll bring back an old character. Yeah, um, it's going to take a while for DC to get into that type of storytelling again. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, like I feel like they're on the. Uh, I feel like they're on the the cusp of it. Um, you want to do the uh, the books of the week? Yeah, they, it fe- it does feel like they are. Mm-hmm. Because now we're getting into like month four, we're slowly getting into like building a bigger world. It is, and um, that will kind of lead into like the first book I'd like to talk about this week. Uh, with going with, but the, you can't the DC relaunch. I'm not allowed to talk about this book. Not allowed to talk about any books. Oh man, no more book talking. Is that is that like a challenge for the show? No more. <laughs> like <laughs> next next episode, John can't use the word the. The. It's <laughs> good exercise. Mm-hmm. No it's. No it's. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Demon Knight number four came out this week, and this is my favorite issue of the series so far. And this is like one of the most bang up books that they've come out with. I yeah, think. man. Yeah. Um, take us through. I don't remember anything in the book. <laughs> 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 I uh, I'm a big fan of Grant Morrison's uh, reboot of Shining Knight. Yes. Um, it's a really great idea, and I kind of shuddered to see them change that. Mm-hmm. And in this particular book, they kind of redo China Knight's uh, origin a bit again, mm-hmm. and it's brilliant. It really is. Um, they took away his uh, him being a female. Number one, mm-hmm. correct? Am I right about that? Yeah. Well, Vanilla Savage calls it calls uh, him a man, him a girl, and also they show him as a squire, right? Uh, but he's still kind of androgynous. Mm. But the fact that he's lived for you know nine thousand years, nine thousand years yeah. plus, uh, 
and they wrote a really awesome Merlin. They and really they, did. Because yeah. he kind of speaks in regular speaking. He's like, I'm mm. the dude who does the things. And mm. can I have that book for a second? Yeah. I'm going to take a look at it real like quick. Like, Mer- Merlin does, he speaks in, in like, in like a regular dude, but in, in riddles at the same time. Like, I am the coming of the end, but I am the future of tomorrow. Uh, come and see me. This is the grail. This is what you need. It's and, very, uh, it's written very much like a, how they would write, like, stuff from Invisibles. Yeah. You know, like, as for, like, a character of higher intelligence. Mm. So the whole thing with Demonites is, like, they're really, like, the, the great conceit of it is, is that it's basically the secret origin of uh, DC via this weird fantasy era. Right. So you have, you know, Jason Blood and, and Demon. Uh, Vandal Savage. Vandal Savage. You have a weird, like, version of, like, Oracle where it's mm. a woman called Horsewoman who's on a horse right. and she's crippled. Um, or she may not, she may not be. Mm-hmm. Um, Vandal Savage is an amazing addition to the team. It really is, yeah. There's like a there's like a an Arab uh, like wizard mm. on the team, and then you have the, the also the introduction of Mordru and um, <sighs> hasn't been proven. Well, yeah. Well, oh, he's Mordru, yeah, yeah, not her. The other one they don't know who it is. The yeah. queen. Yeah, the queen. Um, who I, I was probably gonna be Morgana. This was uh, cool, and also the the fact that they talk about like why Shy Knight lives for so long that he drank from the Grail, right? Um, and immediately you start there's like this immortality thing. And he kind of sees like a swath of the future, mm. and they show him as at one point like a vampire, which I think is a really interesting idea. With, yeah. with I usually don't like vampire stuff, mm. but like I think it's a cool idea with Shine Eye being this kind of like ethereal, uh, like forever child. Well, also, also drinking the blood of the Grail and thirsting after it probably would yes. would do the trick. Yeah, um, and also like I I thought that stuff was really cool too. Where the, in the book that uh, they'll explain they explain how. Um, he felt he, like when nothing was going on, he like he gave he gave his horse a, like a sip of his blood, so his horse is immortal too. But when nothing was going on and he wasn't needed, he would sleep for like hundreds of years at a time, you know. And then until he basically slept under the world tree, and the roots became like his cocoon, yeah, almost. And then he wakes up and went with Fanal Savage and like and they kind of did stuff. They kind of did that with uh with, with uh, the old Grant Morrison thing with the mm. sleeping and, and reborn thing, right? Um, I just realized that now that the container that Merlin puts the Cup in the mm. Grail in has like a lightning bolt symbol, very reminiscent of Shazam. Very interesting. So I wonder if they're gonna do like him being Merlin being, you know, the, the wizard Shazam, you yeah. know, because he is like all the wizards, right, right. Uh, but if they're doing like some type of link, because like there's there's a lot of stuff that you can tell about to happen in this book mm. where they're gonna start talking about what this o- means overall. The same way right. that they're doing Stormwatch. Unfortunately, poor Cornell, Cor- Cornell writes both books and right. he's leaving that book. Uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a real shame. You see what you see the Superman reveal? Where they're going with Superman, George Perez? No. Uh they're gonna fight demonites. Like that whole like alien stuff is all like demonite stuff. Like the parademons? Or no, demonites. Oh, de- like, oh from, like, de- ah, great. From, like Wildstorm. Great. What about the multiverse? Didn't DC own the uh, not the multiverse, the uh the DC own him? The um the Ultraverse. No, that was Marvel. Marvel bought the Ultraverse? Yeah, they had Malibu. Okay. Yeah. All right. They own all that stuff. No one's doing anything with that stuff. I, I wish they did. I wish they did too, man. I, I want to see Prime. <laughs> I want to see Prime. I want to see uh, Freaks was awesome. Freaks. I, that he had the 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 garbage guy. What's his name? Yeah, and he had <laughs> a, the woman made out of like the uh, the wiry skin. Yeah. And she was like a beautiful girl. There's a lot of like really mm-hmm. cool team stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Demon Knights. If if it's up to issue four, pick it up. I don't think it's 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 flying oh off the God. shelves. Demon Knights. Demon Knights. I wonder if they're doing more aliens. Than oh no! <laughs> um, uh, for once, man, I feel like I, it kind of feels good to talk about a couple of DC books this week because we never yeah, really do. Um, another, like a really surprisingly solid read was Batman and Robin number yes, four. Yes, sir. Um, I, for me, it started off a little shaky. It did, you know, with the Ducard thing and well, the you know. the whole i I think I'm very I think we're all kind of wary of them making new characters mm-hmm. at this point, you know, in uh, in the lore. And I wasn't impressed by this whole thing with nobody or anything right. like that. But now, going into it, they're playing with some really interesting stuff with Batman mm-hmm. and Damien. Because, you know, he, Damien has basically ran his entire Robin career with Nightwing. Right. So Batman's putting his foot down and saying, like, listen, man, I don't even trust you. Yeah. You know, you're my son. I still want to protect you. We have a really complicated relationship. So he's kind of, like, turned off by it. Damien being, yeah, and they reveal that nobody is the son of Ducard, one of the people who trained Batman, one of the six mysterious people who trained Batman. Right. Well, see, that was like a cool little thing too in this issue where uh, Damien's like, "Oh, you mean four people?" He's like, "There were six, but you don't, you don't got to know about the other two. Yeah, you won't tell me. Yeah. You won't give me the information. Yeah. I, 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 that's that's fantastic, and it's like you almost forget that. Um, and they establish Damien's age. Damien's ten years old. You know? Did they do that? Um, yeah, because oh. he says like, "Act like a ten year old." 
You yeah. know, and I think and it's an interesting dynamic too because you have Batman really trying to establish himself as the boss and a father figure. Whereas, like, listen, you can disobey me as Batman sometimes, but you have to listen to me if I'm doing dad stuff. You know, just be like a son, dude. It rocked, and like, mm-hmm. I I'm a huge fan of uh, what's his name, uh, Gleason. Oh yeah, he does such a good job mm-hmm. of making everyone's you know emotions very very like on uh-huh. the page. He's very much a school of like uh, Doug Monk. Yeah. Um. The real like you know, there's a lot of conveying of you know, uniqueness with every character. Unique. Yeah. Definitely like thick lines on facial expressions, which I think is the uh, is the bread and butter of this book too. Everyone but, looks yeah. different. Yeah. Everyone, Everyone looks different. different. And he does. He he does it like he doesn't do it. Um. He doesn't phone it in at all because it's. Uh, the emotions are like like you said the emotions are definitely there but he takes it to like a little bit of a cartoony level you know like yeah. at the end where um there's like a nice little bit at the end where Damien's like I'm leaving and I'm taking the dog with me he names his dog for the first time yeah he names it Titus yeah. instead of Ace you know yeah. and um you know and he goes to visit Bruce Wayne's parents graves and he's like he's such an asshole he's, he's like he's <laughs> like I hope you guys know that your your that your son is is a stubborn douchebag and then um nobody shows up and he's like like I can tell you like, like, I'm not going to tell your dad that you almost killed that guy in the alley. Um, if you want to train with me, like, I'll teach you better than him, and I'll teach you the way you want to be trained. And he just kind of morosely looks at his hand, which is covered in um, lightning bug goo. and the, like the light never goes out. Right. You know? And then... It's like a really sad, like, moment yeah. in, in Damien. Uh, I think the rest of the story will be about him kind of teaming up with mm-hmm. nobody and learning his ways and probably yeah. to put a knife in his back. Oh, yeah. It's, sol- it's a solid, solid, mm-hmm. like... This is this is one of those books where you kind of felt like okay, you got it. Yeah, like you absolutely. you've you've done a good job of kind of you know getting out of that uh, mm-hmm. the freshman feeling of the book. That's it a good way to put like it. It feels like an old. Yeah. It feels like uh, like this book has been going on mm-hmm. for a long time, and it's a good payoff. It is, it is a really good payoff, and also like a little little tidbit on the on the previous run in uh, before the relaunch. Uh, one of my favorite shocking moments in the original Batman and Robin run is when um, it's Nightwing as Batman, and there it was like a Joker story. And Commissioner Gordon's like, oh, my God, like Damien's in that room with Joker. And then Nightwing's like, it's not Damien you got to worry about. And then they cut to um, Damien smashing Joker's face in with a crowbar. Crowbar. Yeah, Yeah, dude, he's a bad dude. Yeah, he's a 10-year-old kid. And it's awesome, too, because they're establishing, like, a character that will definitely have longevity in the DC universe. Yeah, which which I was thinking about that today also. I was thinking of this of the surprises. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they first introduced him, I was not impressed at all. I was right. like, I felt like they're going to get rid of him in, in no time or retcon it. It did have that, that that feeling where like he would just fade away somewhere. And know? sure enough, he's mm-hmm. become like my favorite Robin. I'm yeah. sure your favorite Robin. Oh, absolutely. Um, and awesome. he and he has the best variation of the costume too. I love the laced up boots, mm-hmm. boots, the hood, um, Damien, and the four finger gloves, yep. and like he looks awesome. He's like a little badass kid. Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely the son of Batman. Definitely, the son, yeah. <laughs> you know? And definitely also the son of a murderer. Yes, <laughs> Talia. They haven't. They haven't really brought her. She hasn't shown up, right? Not since uh, like the R.I.P. stuff. Okay. When when Deathstroke was hired to uh, kill him. Right. Surprisingly, surprisingly, another um, really excellent bat book this week. Um, Batwoman number four, which also like I will always buy this book, man. Like J.H. Williams the third. I feel like it just it's it's it seems like a like a labor of love. Like he's putting so much into this book. This was the know? book that I was most wary of for because when it was being solicited, mm-hmm. you know, the many times it was not released. Um, I was I was really worried about it because J. H. William III was also writing it, mm. so I was worried that because I was so used to reading awesome Greg Rucka crime battle right. and stuff, right. and this book is dynamite. Like it is a work of art. Mm. It really is. I mean, like this stuff. Like we always talk about how um, flat some of the DC books seem. Um, this is one of those gems that is extremely beautiful. Like you can take any of these pages and hang them up in a gallery. Yeah, man. You know, and especially you have um, uh, great. I forgot her name. Uh, I keep wanting to call Firebird? it Wildfire. Yeah, Firebird. Firebird. Um, you know, she gets really messed up in the first few pages of the book. She's cat. She's Batwoman's uh, younger cousin, right? And she's been training to become this character Firebird mm. for a while. But basically, she got fired the last uh, last issue and said, like, you know, it's too dangerous for you mm. out here. And yeah, no. So she gets she gets gutted. Flamebird. She Flamebird. gets she gets gutted um, by like some random villain with a sickle. And, you know, she's bleeding out in, like, the snow while she's thinking about that. That is her, right? What? More, the, uh, these panels. No, that's, uh, that's while this is all going, while this, like, this amazing right. sequence is going on, you have basically 
Right. Kate King, you know, Batwoman hooking up with uh, Detective Sawyer from the Gotham PD. Right, right, right. So, like, this is a moment, like, this is great, like, you know, dynamic between, you know, what's going on on this side of the storyline and mm. this, like, lovey dovey, uh, basically, Batwoman gang are eating out. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and then you have, you know, like, the Gotham cops are just kind of like, you know, now we can find out who this mysterious Batwoman is through the flame bird. She's almost and she's dead. She's dying. Like, she's yeah. like, she's going to die. You know, so they patch her up and they tell her, like, look, you're going to die. Um, you have to t- you have to let us help you, and she's like get um Kate Kane get Kate Kane, and then like they were like all right we we have like a lead we're gonna figure out what the Batman family's what's going on with them and take her to a real hospital now you know which is like a really ballsy move yeah you know for like any kind of detective well story. you also this is all being orchestrated by um Cameron Chase who works for the DEO which is basically mm-hmm. she's kind of like a superhero hunter for the most right. part uh, and she works for Mr Bones which is an awesome character also Lo- love the fact that Mr Bones is in the book. Yeah, man, oh. uh, and, and Chase is an amazing character. She's been in mm-hmm. Wonder Woman. She's been like Nemesis. Uh, she had her own title, but Jane H. William III mm-hmm. first did a long time ago. Um, and it's just like a really like it's a ruthless comic, but it's so mm-hmm. gorgeous to look at. It really is. I feel like um, it should be longer because this issue was full of, of advertisements, man. Yeah, you yeah, know? it was. There was like there's like five, six pages, seven pages of advertisements at the end, and then like in the book too. Um, but it's a beautiful book, so I'm not gonna complain about it. Um, I would like to complain about it. You want to complain about it? Um, I just want to say that this, I think this, like Batwoman is probably one of my favorite editions and most unique de- uh, decisions in the character. Like, you know, her lesbian stuff b- beside, who mm-hmm. cares? Um, but like just her entire origin, the visual aspect of her, like everything works for this character. And she's right. such an amazing fit for a very serious way of doing Batman stories. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, this uh, is yeah. basically taking the crown of the way, the thing that Gotham Central kind of held. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, like, uh, in my opinion, this is DC's answer to Daredevil. Uh, I was just going to say that. It's very, it's, it has that, that extremely street-level feel where it doesn't seem like any of the little character traits and nuances are phoned in, that they're all there for a reason. Yeah, man. You know, and it doesn't seem like a, like it doesn't seem hack to making her a lesbian at all. You know, it adds to the story. It adds to like a different dynamic of you know she's just kind of like this chick who's trying to get along in the world, but who happens to be Batwoman? You know, I think it, it, and the thing about the the lesbian thing is the I think if they never decided to do that with her, mm-hmm. she wouldn't be around nowadays. I think that was a strong enough idea for people to kind of latch on to it. Right. Um, and they just happen to make her an amazing character on top of that. Like, mm-hmm. it's not the most defining quality of her character. Right, right. Let's, let's, let's do that. That's, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people fall into when they're making, um, like, lesbian or, or gay characters. Mm-hmm. Um, Greg had such a good grasp of this, right. and he's created such an amazing world with them. So, you know, hats off to Greg, Greg, Greg Ruka, who doesn't even work on the book anymore. Yeah. He really was the guy who made this beautifully unique character. He really did. Um, let's jump around here to Walking Dead. Uh, like a little tidbit. Did you see the? No, I didn't get I, my copy. Didn't have that in there. I'm okay. dying to read it. Um, I think comes out next week. I think. Yeah, January. Um, Walking Dead number ninety two. We're steamrolling ahead until issue one hundred. Um, the last issue we had. What issue was this? Uh, ninety two. Wow. We had the uh, the last issue revealed a guy standing on top of a car who's looking at the town, and this issue was the reveal of who the guy was. Yeah, man, you know, who's not Shane? Not <laughs> Shane. Uh, wasn't the main character of the of the regular story. Right. Uh, but what he basically opens up is he's this guy I think like Paul Monroe or something like that, and, is, and he's it's, like, but they call me Jesus. They call me Jesus. Uh, and he is also he beats up two of the toughest characters in the in the comic, yeah. uh, Michonne and uh, Abraham. Yeah. Um, biblical name also. Mm-hmm. Um, but the great thing about it is he's a leader of a whole other crew, and he mm-hmm. kind of reveals that listen, there's like a whole other communities out there right. that you don't even know about. Like you think you're the only you know mm-hmm. schmucks out here who are fighting zombies. Exactly. We're also organized. We've been doing this for a long time. And and he's a badass because you know he he like it seems on uh, you never know what Kirkman. It seems on the re- on, on the surface that he's like this reasonable dude. Um, I would peg him as probably like an ex soldier or something like that. You know. But the Jesus thing always makes me think that this guy's nuts. Well, yeah. yeah. So this is this is the thing that I was thinking about right after I finished the book. Mm-hmm. So constantly we've been hit with you know stories in Walking Dead where you get introduced to a character who is either benevolent or malicious. Right. Um, and usually you know you're, I mean you feel like you're kind of you've been through this so many times before right. that you're kind of jaded and you expect they're going to be you know malicious. Right. So when they did with the uh, the senator. 
the, gov- the governor, not the governor, the the senator who ran this community before he did. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. He had his dark moments, but ultimately he was mm. he made good choices. Right, like, he was doing for the betterment of of the, of the group. Um, the governor was obviously really a terrible human being. Right. But you wonder, like, where are they going with this? Is he uh-huh. is is Rick's paranoia going to overpower this this dude? Like, right. is he really a good dude? And we're going to have. Rick actually murdered this guy because he's too worried about, mm. or maybe Rick is so selfish at this point that he actually thinks killing this dude and taking over his community is going to be a benefit to everybody. I mean, uh, which uh, is uh, probably where they're going to go with that. It's it's a it's a crazy thing about this book is that every issue could be a series of different tipping points. And after reading this issue, the tipping point could be that you know Rick and his community turn into the bad guys, you know, or at least he does. I think uh-huh. I think they kind of are at this point because like. Yeah. Even when you, I think you you probably see this when you watch the show, because um, you're so far away from the point that Rick was in the beginning of the show, right? That you're like, you know, looking for a little girl for for like a bunch of days is a terrible idea, right? Uh, because you're so hardened by this world now, mm. um, you kind of almost side with a lot of like the harder decisions, right? Right. Like you know, if you're being attacked by zombies and you're carrying a little girl and the little girl is getting pushed in, you can't save her. You're done, right. like. Or you got to cut off a lady's arm. Yeah, yeah, you know, which mean, which he did. And like, no, there was like a zombie attack in the community, and you know she like he'd lost. Uh, she like he was holding hands with Carl, a woman, and the woman's son. The woman's son got eaten. Uh, the woman was trying to pull Rick to say we could save him. He took his axe, cut her arm off, and was like, "Let's get out of here, Carl." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't. Well, if you went through the you know half the shit they mm. they went through, it's. You know, it's time to make those really terrible, messed up right. decisions. Um, especially like, uh, what was a, a really good one? Um, I think in any of these stories now, Walking Dead has taught you if there's someone that needs to that speaks up or mm-hmm. like needs to be taken out, they have to take them out right away. Yeah, absolutely. I and it's again, it's it's airing on the side of caution. Yes, you know, and just like, cause, cause nobody's gonna buy that. Rick's not gonna buy that. He's no. like, oh yeah, a lot of communities out there, buddy. And why don't you come here by yourself? Blah give me blah, your, blah. Give like, me your bullets, you know. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it because I feel like I feel like issue uh, 99, issue 98, 99, and 100 are gonna be completely Rough, insane, dude. And I want issue 100 to have some more of that space stuff that they did. Oh uh, yeah, I was just talking about that the other day. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, I yeah, they they did an awesome like alternate reality of like. All the bad ideas they could have done in uh, yeah. in Walking Dead, but didn't do. Right, where uh, it was Rick died and Heaven was populated by everybody who died already. Yeah, and the and that all the alien, they, the zombies came from aliens. Right, and the governor was in like a battle suit, a cyborg, a, a pretty bananas. The uh, uh, they're they're bringing up a really good uh, coming out with a really cool uh, edition of Walking Dead where they're mm-hmm. doing like a behind the scenes stuff. Right. So it's going to be a lot of scripting and stuff like that. But the main thing is showing stuff that they never got a chance to do or changed right. during the run. So that's going to be interesting to see how his brain works in terms of the plotting overall of like Walking Dead. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we can, we can do like entire episodes about this comic. And, and we will. And uh, stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you want to go into a Yeah, let's talk about that. We have to talk about that. That was kind of weird. Uh, this is, you know, we've been looking forward to um, the major Avengers X-Men crossover for quite some time now because, you know, it's always been hinted at and, you know, it was the return of Cable. I always like Cable. You yeah. Know? And, you know, they've done some really cool stuff with them. They don't, they've done some really dark stuff with them. Surprisingly dark stuff. And um, Avengers Extinction number one came out this week, which is like the jump off for the um, for the crossover. And, it you know, it's Jeff Loeb and McGinnis, Dexter Vines, uh, Maury Hollowell. Um, it's, it's a team that has sold a lot of books. Uh, my personal standpoint on it is... Stop it. The idea is kind of there. I don't like the team on it because I'm not taking away from anybody's skills, but I feel like if this is a serious, serious story, like the way they want it to be, I don't want to look at McGinnis's art. No. It has no, no gravity. Yeah. It feels like, you know, because I'm, I'm really bothered by, like, mm-hmm. you know, when they did the, the Red Hulk stuff and, like, they ultimately made Red Hulk into a great character, but, right. like, his stuff is so, like, I like McGinnis's art, but not for something like this. Mm-hmm. This He's uh, much more suited for something that's, I guess, fun, Right. But this is a serious story about like you know people dying and like mm-hmm. you know this has like you know a a last panel that's supposed to have some weight to it. Right. Number one, you don't feel like it does. Yeah, I mean uh, the story. The story is that um, when they did uh, Messiah Complex, was it? And is that when he when cable hope, died? well yeah when uh, cable cable basically died trying to protect his his adopt his foster daughter who he was taking around through time avoiding uh, a crazy bishop and, and bug and, people and bug people <laughs> and ensuring that. 
excuse me, ensuring that she was going to live to be the Messiah of the Mutants. So, you know, Cable gets blown up, but the blacksmith, which I thought was kind of cool. Like, that was cool they brought him back. You know, he ends up with the blacksmith who was like, you know, when, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the, the miniseries when, with uh, Cyclops and uh, Jean Grey. Oh, um, it was, there was a bunch of, there was the, the adventures of uh, Jean Grey and Cyclops, yeah. and they also had Phoenix Cyclops, and they also had... Uh, the Ascani son. Yeah. So yeah. So like you know, he's from like that era of Cable. He's also like, from the original Jeff Loeb um, Cable run. Right. Right. When he first right. came out with him. Right. Yeah. Um, so you know, Blacksmith finds him and he's like, "Listen, um, everything's shot to shit. You have about twenty four hours to live. Um, Cable's techno virus is taking over him. It's making him crazy. He's insane, and he basically has to go back in time to stop the Avengers from." killing hope or not letting hope be the savior to the mutants yeah you know so but it's 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 cable being completely bananas and showing up and the first thing he does you know there's like a big fight downtown or whatever um the first thing he does is he shoots falcon out of the air fine i'm with it um the next thing is you know captain america is like oh hey cable you know we can help you and then there's just like kind of like a really ham-fisted fight between cap and cable which which i really wanted to think was cool but, but it wasn't. It really wasn't, and it just seems like I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of it. I know it was just disappointing. It's it's exactly what I kind of expect out of like mm-hmm. a Jeff Loeb story. Um, I don't understand why they keep on hanging this dude like these big projects because mm-hmm. like you have the opportunity. I, and he probably came up with it. He probably came up with this right. basic idea of like bringing Cable back, which is the same way that Cable always comes back. You know, he the last moment before he died, he time slid to another. Time. Right. <laughs> um, always. Like, it's the same thing where he puts his consciousness in something else. And like, whatever, you need to get to that point. But the thing is, you have you know, this leading into um, the Avengers versus X-Men being the big mm. storyline. You're kind of getting that right now with, this, with Cable. Right. You're going to get it immediately. But you have like Jason Aaron, Jonathan Hickman, mm. Ryan Michael Bendis, Matt Fraction. Why not have one of those dudes do something like this instead of like Jeff Loeb, right. who doesn't really give a crap about continuity mm. or... Making like a really, you know, grown up style, right. uh, mature book. Well, uh, I, w- I want to ask you something. Um, do you ask think, me? Do you think he's crossed the line into Claremont territory? Yes. You know, with the I think he's always been Claremont. Once uh, I think he's Claremont. Like, like once great writer who just like uh, towards like a like a certain point in his career just kind of turns out stuff that's not that great. You know, because like all the Claremont stuff that's come out in the last like ten or ten plus years has been garbage. Well, we've talked about this before. I'm not a fan of Jeff Loeb at all. Right. I think he did some really good stuff. You know, Long Halloween, Dark Victory, um, the uh, Marvel color books, you know, Daredevil right. Yellow, Hulk Gray. But even those, like, I, I think they kind of like dipped in quality. My favorite one being like Spider-Man Blue. Okay. Um, yeah. I can't stand Hush. Me neither. Um, Which is surprising uh, to a lot of people. Most yeah. of his stuff is really like so part. I think mm-hmm. he he appeals to a certain type of audience. I think there's a large mass appeal for him because mm-hmm. it's very easily digestible. Yeah. But there's no complexity and no real like writing skill to him. I think you, I think you just nailed I grown it. You know? all, I grown in all of his lines that he does. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's the uh, it's the blockbuster movie approach. I feel like to comic book writing. Um, again, you know, like he's he's a big name for a reason. But uh, as a fan, personally, I was not thrilled with this, and I really, I was really looking forward to it, you know, and I was really expecting something major because um, this has been the first Marvel crossover since Fear, since Fear itself, yeah, which was fantastic. Every Marvel crossover the past few years has been fantastic. Um, this kind of let me down in the first issue, you know. It totally let me down, I, and I, I really had no expectation for this because this originally mm-hmm. was to be called Cable Reborn. Right. And just be a mini series, and it's like, you know what? This kind of t- this can mm-hmm. really be a, a good moment for us to do the Avengers X Men stuff. I would have been happy with that, you know. And like, and, and you know what? I feel like you know what's gonna happen. He's gonna he's gonna trap or ensnare a ton of Avengers. Nothing's really gonna hold any weight, and it's gonna turn out that Hope shows up and says like, "It's okay, Dad. You're cool." And hmm. he's gonna become the baby again, like in Deadpool. <laughs> Oh, the baby, cable. baby cable. Yeah, like baby cable. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah. I never thought about him. Well, he's so like messed up and old now. Yeah. I think they do have to, you know, scale him back because he's dying again. Right. He's always dying. Yeah. I mean, like you can't like see that's the thing with cable is like he's he's died and come back so many times where like this you need to put weight behind this the story to have the character live because if he shows up, does something, sacrifices himself again, and like disappears, I don't want that. I don't want. I don't want that at all. Yeah. So this is, I think your homework assignment should be, you need to start catching up with Uncanny X-Force because mm-hmm. they address the idea of rebirth very, very well. All right, well, the new issue came out, so fill us in. What's the, uh, 
Oh man, I don't want to do it. Yeah, well, well, I want to hold this <laughs> off because I okay. really because I want to have at length discussion about this, especially closer to the end of the year. Okay. When we start talking about like our favorite stuff, because this was a book that dealt with death and rebirth, team mm-hmm. structure. And like the idea of Apocalypse, who always ends up coming back over and over again, right? I had to mess with that. Plus, being huge Grant Morrison X Men fans, mm. uh, the development of Phantom X into what he is now in that book is that tremendous. Yeah. And using stuff like Age of Apocalypse, mm. um, they've made you know they have some so kind of a little bit of a spoiler before we talk into that. Uh, they have some holdovers now from the Age of Apocalypse. Well, Nightcrawler's on the team, right? Nightcrawler yeah. is, is going to stick around. Sinister Iceman, Iceman from that world okay. is a bad guy now. Uh-huh. He's like said, "Screw it, I, you know, I'm so powerful, I can be a bad guy." Right. He's here still. Um, Wild Child died. Okay. Um, Sunfire died. Uh, Blob mm-hmm. from that world still here. Okay. Dark Beast, Sugar Man. Um, Sugar Man. Sugar Man. Yeah. Plus, they revealed that Phantom X has three brains. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Dude, I love the Phantom X. So character. much, so. and they have, a, and they have an awesome, mm-hmm. uh, some great, like some of the best Angel stuff you'll ever read. Mm-hmm. The book really became about Phantom X, uh, Angel, and um, uh, Psylocke. Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure like a, a like kind of a love triangle. But one of the coolest possible things is I am a char- I I've really grown tired of Deadpool. They have made Deadpool's voice so unique in that book yeah. and really likable. That's awesome, man. I, I, I def, that's going to be my homework assignment for this week. I got to catch up on uh, 18 issues. Uncanny X Force. I read the first six, seven, eight. Issues. Deathlock, awesome, man. Really. They did an incredible thing with Deathlock. I, I got I to gotta read it. It's, it's, Plus, it's, you need to be up on your stuff because it's going to start crossing over with Secret Avengers and right, Venom. Right, right. Excellent. Do it. I will. I'm leaving right now. Um, you want to you want to wrap it up with this? Yeah. And our little theories. Theories. Um, all right. So battle star battle scars battle stars <laughs> battle scars number Galactica. two. <laughs> battle star Galactica, great TV show. Um, <laughs> uh, battle star battle scars number oh, I can't say it. Battle, battle scars, scars number two um, came out, and the, the the guarantee behind this book was that. There's going to be a big reveal with the main character, who is um, this black guy named Marcus Johnson. Yep. Right? And, you know, the first issue was he goes to his mom's funeral. The funeral gets attacked by Taskmaster. He is uh, about to get killed by Taskmaster. Cap shows up, takes place. Now, second issue, it's the battle between Cap and Taskmaster. This guy's hurt, gets patched up by S.H.I.E.L.D. You still don't know who this guy is. Um, you know, his fa- Yeah, his, his father is someone important. Right. And then he has these... Um, there's like agencies who are after him. He escapes. He's trying to figure out why they want him. So in the last the last couple of pages, you see um, Scorpio comes back, um, right? Yeah. And um, then you see him saying like, "We're going to go after Taskmaster and get some answers." Now this this comic. But the is, other thing they also did also they kind of gave some background on him where he was a soldier who did his first tour and mm-hmm. then left and became like an I like a like an Ivy League schooler right. and then checked himself back into the army. So he's a they're trying to establish that he's got brains and he's you know an incredible soldier. Right. Because right. he really does kick ass in this book. He does. And um and they don't reveal, not a terribly great book either. They don't reveal if he's superhuman or not, but um, there's a lot of theories going on with this character and with this book, which is great, you know. And like you, uh, you approached me today with um, with yours. Yeah. So I came up with this idea, and and honestly, I was talking to you, and then I went on the internet and checked Bleeding Cool, and they posted my exact theory to a point. So uh-huh. I'm I feel very deflated <laughs> from it. But the idea is this. All right. So this book is going to wrap up in say four plus months. Right. Um, you have all this espionage stuff going on. Mm-hmm. What I really feel is going to happen is that they're going to reveal that this kid is Nick Fury's son, mm-hmm. uh, his black son. So <laughs> he had sex with a black lady. He's got this black kid, Marcus Johnson, put him into hiding, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, made sure he wasn't known or anything. I guarantee you Nick Fury will die at sometime near the end of the story. He mm-hmm. will get his eye cut out, and he will become, he will take the guise of Nick Fury right. just in time for Avengers to come out and them to have a black Nick Fury in the regular Marvel Universe. Because it makes sense. It is it makes totally sense. going to happen. And that's the thing that Marvel does is they'll they'll update their comics to whatever um, whatever uh, movies coming out. Um, after after you told me your theory and you know I read the issue and everything, uh, my own twist on it is that he is actually he Nick Fury who is in the Marvel Universe now is the probably the best life model decoy that money could buy um, because there was a period in time where he disappeared for a while and then he showed up and he got all this stuff done, you know, which I would assume I don't is want this part of his programming, right? No? Yeah. 
And I feel like this kid has Nick Fury's con- his, his real consciousness in his body, and that's that's going to be the reveal. You know, you know that what? he's actually Nick Fury. You know why I'm so against that? Because that would take away from all the Secret Warrior stuff. It would. That it would, would like totally you know. like like it's one thing because I I kind of feel they're going to do this thing with with you know like a Black Fury. Mm-hmm. Um, I really do not want them to like really mess with something like that where you know you're rerunning Jonathan Hickman's awesome run. Right. Right. Uh, but I mean, like that's the thing with with Marvel books is I feel like you know they're playing out so far ahead of time that you have to sign off on an idea like that. And at this point, it's only issue two, so it's all like conjecture. You yeah. Know? But you'll get. I think you'll get Black Fury. And they were doing a t- they, the the reason why this came up is during one of Axel Alonso's uh, interviews on Fridays on mm-hmm. CBR. He you know he's the editor of Marvel right now. Uh, he kind of gave a hint and he said, uh, "Keep your eye or eyes on um, that book." Okay. So there's. I mean, there's so much stuff with spies and she, yeah, and shield and all that stuff. So there's they're going somewhere with that. And like, if you're having Scorpio show up, yeah, it's yeah, definitely Nick Fury stuff. Because now and you're that. talking about you know his legacy and his kids. Mm-hmm. See, but that but the other thing is uh, which is which which kind of fits both our theories is the fact that um, everybody seems to know who this guy is, you know. And when he's in, he's getting um, taken care of by the nurse, Captain America comes in. He's like. Hey, Captain, what's going on? He's like, you know what? You can call me Steve. And he's like, I don't think I want to be doing that. You know, so there's kind of like this relationship that's already there. And when Duggan sees him and... Oh, he's, he's like, yo, that's the dude. You know, like that's the guy. And then, but you're, I think you're absolutely right where it's going to set him up to be the new Nick Fury because his best friend is also a giant redheaded dude. Yeah. And yeah. his name is Cheese. <laughs> Who's going to be the other Duggan? Yeah. You know? I don't want them both to die. Yeah. The only thing that stops me from him being him dying is uh, the... Um, that Nick Fury's gonna start showing up in Defenders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is. What's that? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Say uh, no more. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Nick, yeah, Nick Fury's gonna start showing up in Avengers. It's good. It's 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 good. It's good stuff. Yeah, I guess so. It's I just stuff. don't want. It. I think it's a dumb idea. I I like being. I like I like the fact that I'm sold on on the fact that I, all the writers are like, this is gonna be major. You should read this book. Yeah. You know? It's it's the I think it's one of the books that is not getting a lot of attention. And you have and you have like a good you have Yost, Fraction, and Bun on it. Yeah. Who are like the future kind of architects. Well this was gonna know? be this was supposed to be the uh combined with um Fearless. Right. Um which is also the aftermath of uh, Fear Itself. Mm-hmm. Um but they felt this was a strong enough storyline to kind of go alongside mm-hmm. with that. I feel like I feel like this book isn't really gonna get picked up and I feel like it's gonna do tremendous in uh, trades. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah. once they do the reveal of him being the Fury Son, that's gonna be a big deal. Yeah. All right. Well, I happen. think uh, I think we're good. All right. Are you good? Are, are you good? Are, are you good? How you doing? Um, are you good? All right. That's, that's a little creepy. Andrew, are you good? Um. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, thank you for watching another episode of Behind the Counter. I'm Rich Stambolian. I am Moloch.